When I was 13 years old, I had to look at my home going up in flames. The May family's farmhouse met the same fate as all the other houses of the Eifer village Volseifen. After enormous damage resulting from World War II, and despite of post-war reconstruction, it was almost completely razed from the ground after 1946. The only thing that had been left for their estate is this old apple tree. In the church book of the Sicilian choir, we found the following, and at the same time, last entry of Verger Peter Tennyson. From the neighboring villages Morsbach, Herhan, Dreiborn, the Walseifen people witnessed how their village fell into ruins. In the evening of the Feast of Corpus Christ in 1947, the church itself was also burning. The last hope vanished. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. The Eifer village Walseifen was situated some 50 kilometers of Aachen, 570 meters above sea level, and in immediate vicinity to the former NS Ordensburg Vogelsang. The NS Ordensburg Vogelsang was used to educate and shape the Nazi elite from 1936 onwards. After the invasion of Poland, it functioned as Adolf Hitler's school. The Ordensburg, in combination with the Oftel Dam and its dam wall, had been a strategically important bomb target for Allied attacks. Being so close to these two targets, the village of Wolseifen came under fire in 1944 from the approaching Western Front. Mr. Mai, you were eight years old when the war reached Vogelsang. How did that make you feel? Actually, I didn't feel anything at all. So it has been hard to realize what was going on, I suppose? Yes, that's true. So in case of an attack, what did you do? Did you flee into a bunker? Mostly, we went into a bunker. Right opposite our street, there was one. We were in there rather quickly. Were you afraid? Yes, of course. What kind of feeling is it, sitting in a bunker and knowing bombs are dropping from the sky? I remember one attack when we were in the bunker and a bomb hit it. There was a hole of about 20 centimeters in the concrete, not more. Did you feel it? Yes, it made grrr inside. How old were you when the war reached Vogelsang in 1945? 15 years old. What was it like for you? Well, you had to get used to it. All the aerial bombing, the planes that flew around. There was no German defense anymore. And so the Allies had the air sovereignty. How many people died during the air raids? I remember one attack. A planned one, with several bombs on December 15th. Almost 40 civilians, locals, died. Children, women, men. So basically, your neighbors. Yes, and there was a direct hit, some 50 meters away from us, where the whole family died, despite of one girl who wasn't at home then. Did you feel sympathy for these people? Yes, of course, as you can imagine. We took the girl into our house and cockered her up for a couple of weeks. People helped each other a lot? Yes, absolutely. But I have to admit that we got used to it later on. People and census didn't. Didn't, yes. The Western Front approached closer and closer, and Walsaven had to face permanent American attacks. On January 21st, we find the following entry in Peter Tennyson's notes. That was the most horrible day I have ever seen. The attack took half an hour. Ten more civilians lost their lives. Four or five places caught fire. Our precious little village was turned into a desert. Now, on January the 22nd, we got the eviction order. There was the order of evacuation. What was it like for you hearing this? It was a really bad feeling, sure, because we didn't know where we were taken to. You lost your home? Yes, 
we lost our home. And yes, we were brought from Walbauerhof to Eitdorf upon Sieg. There was a reception camp. This is where we had to go to. What conditions were there? Many people, little space? Well, it wasn't that comfortable, to say the least. We all had lice. With the father being at front, 13-year-old Hubert May, his five younger siblings, mother and aunt, had to fend for themselves. They marched to Lichtenberg, a food where they experienced the end of war. After that, the two women took the six children and started their way back home. The first desirable destination was Cologne. Their march became more straining because they had to pull, or rather push, a modified two-wheeled cart packed with a 100 kilogram of baggage. After a week of marching, they finally arrived at their destination and joined the other homecoming families on their way along the Dorfstraße towards the destroyed village Walseifen. We were back at the beginning of March, a food from our refugee camp in Nöten near Münstereifel. What did this place look like when you returned? Very, very desolate. We came back in, first to the church, then to our house, and then we were happy. Our house was still there, everything wasted, the roof destroyed by the air pressure, all furniture was put outside, that was typically American. This is what they did everywhere. They threw out the furniture they didn't like. We tried to arrange the things slightly home-like. The NS Ordensburg Vogelsang had been functioned as an initial contact point for the Waldorfen people to equip themselves with new furniture. Well, we had a central heating, for example, but no fuel. I told you before that we had a little horse with a cart. So I went there and loaded up some coke and went back home. I remember my father. There were lots of lockers and tiles that were knocked off the walls. In the evenings, we bandaged the horse's feet with cloth so it couldn't be hurt. Nicely covered up. That was a funny sight. Half a year later, was it a normal village life for you again? Yes. There was hope again. All the people were back home. We were recovering. Mass had already been said since Easter. The war hadn't been over yet when Mass was said. I was up in the church steeple using a pair of bellows so that the verger could play the organ because there was no electricity. So basically you thought that everything would go its way again, kind of normal village life? But the village was still in ruins. And at some point the power supply was working again and we managed to make the water pipes working again and there was hope again. Your daily life was still coined by wartime leftovers. Yes, there was one accident happening with an egg egg gun. Some children were playing, playing with the gun. I was nearby. Approximately 100 meters away when I suddenly heard a loud bang. It was a barrel burst. A grenade had still been in the gun and the children knocked against it until it finally went off. One of the children died some 10 minutes later. A young lad. Another one lost both his hands. The third one was lucky. I picked up the one boy who lost his hands and collapsed on the streets with my horse and brought him home. He died there later. What was it like being so close to the incident? <laughs> that wasn't easy at all. One of them was my cousin. I knew him very well and also the other children. But we still had the war in our minds and bodies. 
everything was we were didn't. My father had a splinter in his head. He was bleeding like a stuck pig. I also brought him home the days all over bar. After the Walseifen people had new hopes and plans for a better future, the next and last evil tidings were pronounced on August the 13th, 1946. The men gathered, as usual, in front of the church after high mass. When Mayor Nikolaus Döhler, who was put in office by the Americans, joined them, he announced the eviction order. The eviction order was a shock for all inhabitants. Deathly silence spread amongst them. How did you feel when you heard about the eviction order? Well, we were standing in front of the church after mass, like always, chatting when the major turned up and told us the military government gave us three weeks to leave. Nobody believed it at first. It was a shock. The village had been absolutely silent for days. And then it began. Where to go? Nobody asked about that. We just had to leave. From now on, every family had to care and fend for itself. The searching started, hunting for accommodation. Most people liked to stay close to the village. The elders were sure that because it was military, they would return home in a couple of weeks. But me... But the younger ones knew that this was not going to happen. But me, I said instantly, we are not coming back home. My father was on the way for days and found nothing. Suddenly a woman from a neighboring village came to us and said, we had a small grocer's right next to our house. Have you asked us? That was in... We had room there. We were 11 people. We needed lots of space. So we went there. They had an inn, which was closed, of course, but there were the premises and this was where we stayed. Actually, it was pure luck. Yes, it was a blessing in disguise. How did you find a place to stay? My father was looking for accommodation as well, and his search brought him to Dryborn, where we finally moved in with an old man who was living there together with his daughter. Were you able to see what happened to Walseifen at that time? We hadn't been away for a long time when stealing started. Committed by PWs, German prisoners of war, who worked as drivers for the English. That's when I told my father, do you know what? We go nicking with them. No, no, when we return back home, I said, Daddy, we are not going back home. So in the evenings I took my horse and cart, went into the village and I took everything that was actually ours. You weren't allowed to come here? No, it was forbidden. Well, I do remember when we were in Dryborn, now we were living in Dryborn, And we could see the Waldorfen church bursting into flames. And my father said, we're never going back home again. The my family with their six children finally found shelter in five kilometers away village of Dryborn in a farmhouse where an old man lived together with his daughter. As most other families, the my family found refuge in the nearby villages. People were eager to help the Walsaven people and tried to improve their lot, although the war left all of them in pitiful poverty. After two or three years, most of the villagers had found a new place to stay where they lived self-sufficiently. Their new homes were still rich places, but they kept their hopes for a better future vividly alive nevertheless. In 1949, Mr. Mai and his family moved to Marmagen, which is 16 kilometers away from Waldseifen. 
Their odyssey finally found an ending in 1952. The federal government enabled a housing development scheme for displaced persons, which gave 15 farming families from Wolseifen the opportunity to set up their own existence in Raffelsbrand. But this was only achievable through very hard work. We were happy when we had found a new home seven years later. 